Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage. But I ain't talking about garbage today. This is a review of The Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance, a 10-episode prequel series based on the 1982 fantasy film The Dark Crystal, a movie that I actually don't hate, which is the highest rating a movie can get on my two-star system. The Dark Crystal was a movie produced and directed by Jim Henson, who you might know as the creator of The Muppets, and co-directed by Frank Oz, who you might know as the puppeteer and voice of Yoda in the Star Wars movies. It was a fantasy movie about an elf-like creature called a Gelfling, who goes on a quest to retrieve a shard broken off from a magic crystal, and return it to the crystal to restore the balance of good and evil on his planet. In many ways, The Dark Crystal is the quintessential 80s fantasy movie. It's best known for its dark tone, creepy atmosphere and imagery, but most of all, its use of puppets. Almost everything you see in the movie is some kind of puppet or animatronic, and there's an insane level of attention to detail. Pretty much everything you see is something that doesn't exist in real life. So it's like seeing a whole other world, all brought to life using old school filmmaking techniques. A sequel was planned that was shuffled from studio to studio for years until it was finally cancelled. Then the script was adapted into a comic book series called The Power of the Dark Crystal in 2017. I've never read the comics, so don't ask me about it. Anyway, somebody pitched the idea to make a prequel series to Netflix in 2017. Originally, they planned to make the show CGI, but ultimately decided to go with puppets for the series. And then they spent the next two years building practically everything we see on the show today. And that brings me to the first reason you should watch it. The production value. It seems kind of weird at first to see these kinds of puppets in a modern, big-budget TV show, especially when juxtaposed with modern CGI effects. But think of it like the difference between watching a movie and watching a stage play, or a 3D animated movie versus a traditionally animated one. Obviously, one is going to look more realistic than the other, but that's not the point. I appreciate the artistry that goes into these things. It's nice to see a creature who's actually physically there, in front of the camera, as opposed to some glossy cartoon that was added in post. There are CG effects, of course, but they're only really used for things that had to be done with CGI. And there's really no mistaking that the star of the show is the puppetry. It's not just the characters. Almost everything you see in the show is something somebody actually made, so it really feels like a throwback to the original Dark Crystal from 1982. Only with the aid of modern animatronics and a little digital enhancement, the new puppets are a lot more expressive and lifelike. I mean, yeah, the mouths still kind of just flop up and down when they talk like anime characters or something, but your brain quickly adjusts to it so you don't even see the puppets anymore after a while, just the characters. Netflix also has a making-of documentary, and it shows just how insanely complicated the production was. It's not like most modern movies where everything is green screen and CGI and you can just move things around and post if something doesn't work out. The whole show is like one giant Rube Goldberg machine, where every action had to be meticulously planned out to make it all work. It really makes you appreciate how much effort and passion went into it. Oh, and the show also features the voices of Simon Pegg, Jason Isaacs, and Mark Hamill. The characters. There's a lot of strong characterization in this show. You know exactly what everyone wants, what the personalities are like, what their weaknesses are, and so on. Without spoiling anything, let's subject each character to the Plinket test. That is to say, we describe them without saying what they look like, what kind of costumes they wear, or what the professions or roles in the show are. We'll start with Rian, since he's the first main character we see. He starts off as a sort of immature kid who sees everything as a game and doesn't take anything seriously, up until he realizes nobody takes him seriously. He lives in the shadow of his father, who he wants to make proud, and will do reckless and stupid things in the attempt. You might call him recklessly selfish as he pressures his friends into going along with him and his dangerous schemes, but he eventually learns to set aside himself and his own happiness for the greater good. Then there's Brea. She's the head-in-the-clouds bookworm type who others always badger for spending too much time reading and not enough time being useful, and is constantly being infantilized by her own family. She values knowledge for knowledge's sake, but more importantly she values truth, and she will go to great lengths to reveal the truth, even if that means rocking the boat much to the ire of those around her. Then there's Deep, my personal favorite character. She comes from a sheltered life and, as a result, is very curious about the world outside her home, but is also very naive and doesn't understand how strangely she comes across to other people. This combines with her inordinate kindness stemming from a lack of exposure to the politics of the outside world makes her endearing. But despite her ignorance, because she comes from a place that's different from the rest of the world, she also possesses unique knowledge and skills which enable her resourcefulness, so it's not like she's always the dumb one. Her lack of knowledge about the world also makes her a sort of audience surrogate, as she sees and reacts to all the weird fantastical elements which are normal to everyone else, because everything she sees for the first time is also being seen by the audience for the first time. So as things are explained to her, they are also explained to the audience. 
so it's like we're experiencing the world through her eyes, which, of course, makes her more empathetic. But arguably, the real stars of the show are the villains, the Skeksis. All of them are larger than life and have a dominating presence on screen. They can be goofy and comedic when a scene calls for it, but there's no mistaking that these are dangerous people who are so unapologetically evil and cruel that every scene they're in is a reminder of what's at stake. So we have a cast of characters with diverse personalities and backgrounds, which is more than what I could say about some of the things I review on this channel. Speaking of diversity, non-forced representation. The problem with forced representation, forced diversity, forced inclusion, or whatever you want to call it, is that makes it come across like the movie or TV show is putting a political agenda ahead of storytelling or artistic integrity, or like it's pandering to the current social climate for reasons that are external to the story itself. Almost by design, it takes you out of the story to start preaching about identity politics. The very type of white guilt, all men are sexist nonsense many people watch movies and TV shows specifically to get away from. Perhaps the most obnoxious manifestation of this is when they take an established character and change their race or gender for no reason other than so they could say they have a character who's that race or gender. Where I come from, that's called tokenism. But that's the new fad in Hollywood now as every major studio scrambles to collect brownie points from the social justice crowd to try to make everyone afraid to criticize them for fear of accusations of prejudice. Hey look, we made the Ghostbusters all women now, isn't that progressive? What's that? The movie is unfunny and poorly written? Well, you're just a sexist who hates women, you're probably racist too. Age of Resistance isn't like that. Instead, it takes an approach to progressive themes that isn't stupid, obnoxious, self-defeating, or in-your-face. And in doing so, it doesn't come across like it's desperately trying to seek approval from the pink hair crowd, which is why I don't have a problem with it. In the show, Gelfling society is portrayed as matriarchal in nature, in the sense that the highest positions of power are held by females called Maldra, which are basically queens with hereditary power. But the show doesn't portray the males as second-class citizens, and they can still achieve high status, as in the case of Acadia, the elder of the Sifa clan, or Ordon, captain of the guard at the Castle of the Crystal. While this is arguably a feminist theme, the show doesn't go out of its way to draw attention to it. At no point does anybody get accused of toxic masculinity or mansplaining, nor does it portray all the female characters as good or better than any of the male characters. There's also a same-sex couple, which I didn't even notice until one of the characters casually mentioned that she has two fathers, and none of the other characters comment on it or treat it like it's a big deal. Nobody ever turns to them and says, Oh, you two are so brave to be so open about your love for each other, or some crap like that. It's treated like it's so mundane and normal in this society that nobody even pays attention to it. It's like the show is simply acknowledging that gay people exist, without waving it around as if to say, Hey look, we have gay people in our show, isn't that progressive? The show even tackles the subject of racism in a way that isn't hitting you over the head or trying to guilt trip certain segments of the audience. One of the main characters comes from a clan nobody has heard from in a really long time, so all kinds of rumors have spread about them, causing them to be treated unfairly by other Gelfling. But this prejudice isn't treated like a one-way street because all of the clans are mistrustful of each other to at least some degree. So the show takes a pretty realistic approach in that nobody is entirely blameless when it comes to prejudice, and everyone is equally capable of it. Just like racism in real life, which isn't as black and white as it's often portrayed in modern media. The writing. I wouldn't say the writing is mind-blowing or that's going to change the way TV shows are written or analyzed anytime soon, but I haven't noticed any obvious plot holes on my first viewing, which is more than what I could say for most modern media in this age in which Hollywood has conveniently decided that the logic of a story doesn't matter. And while I'm on the subject, let me just point out that a story being in the fantasy or science fiction genres doesn't excuse plot holes. Obviously these stories aren't going to be realistic, but that's not the issue. Even in a story which doesn't represent reality, we should still expect it to make sense according to its own established logic. If you establish that it's possible to bring a robot back to life early in the story, you can't kill off another robot later on and tell us they can't be brought back to life without giving an explanation. There's nothing stupid like that in Age of Resistance. All of the magical fantasy stuff has clearly established rules, and it sticks to those rules. And that's important because, when you know what can and can't happen, you know what the stakes are, and that makes tension possible. So it's not like the hero can just easily get out of any situation by just pulling something out of their ass or having inexplicable knowledge or skill in something that blatantly contradicts their backstory. For example, by having a character clearly say they don't know how to fly a spaceship, and then having the same character fly a spaceship in the sequel, even though they spent the entire time between both movies in a coma. 
Age of Resistance manages to be internally consistent for the most part, which really shouldn't be high praise, but that's more than what most modern shows manage to accomplish. I mean, there are a few nitpicky things here and there, but you could say that about anything, and they don't really affect the big picture in the way some plot holes in some other franchises do. Beyond that, there's not much more I could say about the plot without spoiling it. The show also has themes about the importance of exposing corruption, and efforts by those in power to control a narrative by silencing or demonizing those who speak the truth, or even by convincing the public that knowledge is dangerous, using shaming tactics to silence dissenters, and violence when that doesn't work. Whatever that's an allegory for, I'll leave to your interpretation. Alright, so, I didn't really write an outro for this video, so, uh... I guess this is $10 Patriots. Alex Contreras, Landis, Charles J. Harris, e Echidna, John Gavura, John Jaron Marles, John Wellington, Keith Paul, Lex Reardon, Mick Squizzy, Michael Lowe, Paco, Ricky Baruga, The King in Yellow, Toastface, and Victor Alexandrovich Gontar. Th those are my patrons. You should all be supporting me on Patreon, Patreon and uh, following me on Twitter. And uh, sending me your your fan art on Facebook or Twitter, either's either's okay. All the links are in the description. Bye.